Welcome to the Career and Life Show, and welcome to episode three. We have a very, very special interview today with none other than the great actor, Bill Allen, a.k.a. Crew Jones from the movie Rat. I am super excited about this. It's going to be great to take a trip down memory lane. We're going to talk to Bill about his humble beginnings, how he got the part in Rad. We're going to dissect the movie Rad. What else Bill is up to in his life now, now that Rad's uh, 35 years ago. And it's going to be a lot of fun. And the 1980s was a lot of fun if you were a kid growing up, especially with the movies. You had the culmination of the Star Wars trilogy. You had Back to the Future. Indiana Jones came out. Color Purple. Field of Dreams. So many awesome movies. And in 1986, you had a little-known movie called Rad about BMX bike racing and a young kid who got his shot, similar to what Rocky did, got his shot to get into a bike race and compete in Hell Track. So here we are with Bill Allen, and let's get right to it. And in the words of Rad and in the spirit of Rad, let's walk this sucker. Our world is changing faster and faster. Humans are constantly on the go. Over 70% of people are not happy in some way. They're living in the shadows of fear, especially in their careers and life. Are we humans doomed? I don't think so. And that's where I come in. My name is Joseph Stanley Reichowski, otherwise known as Joe Wu. Each week, I seek to uncover what it takes to truly live your life to the fullest by finding out through interviewing people what were their failures and what did it take for them to reach success? Their stories are truly inspiring and perhaps they'll inspire you to let go of your fear and live your career and life to the fullest. Okay, everybody, today I have a very special guest and Mr. Bill Allen, who really needs no introduction here. He is a Hollywood actor, he's done some amazing, amazing work, and in the spirit of Rad, let's walk this sucker and get onto it. So, Bill, how you doing? I'm doing very good, Joe, really. Uh, you could introduce me. Not everybody knows the movie Rad. I mean, right. I appreciate the superlatives, <laughs> but I must say... Uh, for the fans of Rad, uh, it, it was a cult movie, I think, that has now kind of crossed over into the mainstream. It was released, what, in August on uh, Blu-ray and is now on all these multiple streaming platforms. So now everybody who wants to see it can see it. And not only that, it's yep. way up in the feed. So uh, it's been a huge hit on iTunes. And people are discovering this movie for the first time on their own. So that's pretty exciting. I know. And I introduced my kids to it over the last couple of months. You know, we saw some clips on YouTube, I guess some uh, some uh, clips out there. And they were like, wow, this is really interesting. So we're going to be watching it uh, this weekend. So it's great. But thanks for, thanks for coming on here. And I really appreciate it. Cool. So uh, first question I have for you is what, what got you into acting? Like what made you say, hey, this is what I want to do? Um. I would say I kind of fell into it by default. I mean, in school, I wasn't good at anything. Does that sound familiar? Oh, yeah. But, act, but acting. It was really kind of my thing. Uh, I just I just had an easy uh, way about me when I could read and, and, and stand up in front of an audience. And so that was never a real struggle for me. And then lo and behold, when I was 19 years old, uh, I got hired for the lead in a movie uh, that shot on location. Uh, I starred as this jockey in a very rad-like kind of Rocky scenario, winner takes all right. uh, uh, movie. And so that got me into the business. It got me my first SAG card, got me a little money, got me out to the West Coast. And so it was very auspicious and just very out of left field that I, I was handed a professional acting job really without even trying. Yeah. So, so that's what got me out here. And, and I really took it seriously after that. Uh, I, I started taking really 
high level professional acting classes, started hanging out with the best actors that I could find, which included people like Brandon Lee and Miguel Ferrer, who we recently lost. And, and uh, my, you know, peers at that time were people like George Clooney and, and Brad Pitt and uh, Lou Diamond Phillips, who's been a friend forever. So I was thrust into an artistic community that really supported one another and uh, really um, came to one another's aid uh, when, when we needed it most. So uh, these, these individuals largely don't happen by themselves. They happen in pods and groups. Right. And so that's what I attribute any of my success on is the people I was hanging out with kind of showing me the way, you know, and I had some very designated mentors, mm -hmm. guys 20 years older than I, that were showing me the ropes and, and, and holding classes and focusing on me in particular, because I had a great personal relationship with these guys. So, right. so I took it very, um, I took it seriously as a business and uh, I had a lot of really nice luck. That's awesome. That's great. So your first role, that was And You're Off, right? The uh, jockey movie, correct? And, and they're off, yeah. Right, great. So I know I read a little bit in your book, you mentioned about preparation. So when you're an actor, what really goes into preparation? I know you study it a lot, but is there just so much intense that really goes into trying to get into the role and really immersing yourself into there? Well, it depends on the role, uh, certainly. And uh Finding good mentors, I think, is vital because uh, a bad teacher can mess you up a lot worse than no teacher at all. So you can find very good actors who have learned on the set. They have a natural ability. And I've known actors that, that don't have an academic background, let's say. Uh, and I do know actors who have graduated great theatrical programs and have gone nowhere. So uh, 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 Juilliard, resume or, or diploma doesn't necessarily give you entree into the business. Connections, being at the right place at the right time, having a certain amount of drive. It's not always the best people that get the job. It's the people that are there getting it done, you know, right. and, and it's one of those businesses where, you know, it really helps to know people. Gotcha. And then I know you mentioned too about spending time around George Clooney, uh, you know, the late great Brandon Lee and, and obviously Lou Diamond Phillips, kind of your your peer group, do they help you too? Or just kind of, as you guys work together, or grow together, learn from each other and, and give each other pointers and things like that too? Very much. I mean, we didn't <clears throat> sit around talking acting necessarily when we were offset or not in acting classes, sure. but uh, we spent a lot of time with one another and bounced ideas and how did you get this job and and how's this working out for you so you find out about the business in in that way and it kind of removes the mystery from the business and it makes it go okay makes you go okay i can actually get through this without a crystal ball you know gotcha gotcha yeah. so what was it like though spending your time around you know the greats like george clooney and obviously brandon lee and, and, and lou diamond phelps that must have been something you know hanging around that that core group of people back then and especially uh, absolutely absolutely and for every one of you named there's 10 that you wouldn't know about but were equally as talented i must say so uh it it was just a very heady period for me i was a young man living in hollywood kind of uh, very intent on 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 seeking my dreams and finding out what that that meant for me and I put myself in a group of people who were doing that very same thing and I was just lucky that it happened to be that group of people sure and that that they embraced me in the way that I needed to be and so I felt very supported and there was always something going on because I'm a musician also and so uh you know we we're hanging out with Melissa Etheridge and Steve Lukather from Toto was right. was part of the inner circle also and uh, Miguel was a drummer too and Bill Moomy from Lost in Space he was a good friend and, and a very accomplished musician so there was a lot of music thrown in there at the same time so there was always plays there were always gigs there were always uh professional gigs and you're surrounded by people who are who are just in the mix right and and eventually you get in the mix too you know it's right. really yeah it's really true that you surround yourself with people that vibrate 
you know, forgive the term, it's the same frequency, but are having the yeah. same thoughts and the same dreams and the same desires. And they just kind of happen. You know? Yeah. And they elevate like, you. You know, they bring you up here and, and, you know, they hold you accountable too. That's right. That's right. Great. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I was just, I was just emailing with uh, John Lee Hancock, who's an oh, A-list wow. movie director now, uh, The Blind Side and, and uh, Saving Mr. Banks. And he was part of that group also. Oh, he wow. directed and wrote shows for Brandon and, and, and Lou and myself and my brother. So uh, yeah, I'm pretty, pretty proud that I was part of a group that, that really kind of made a difference in, in the business. That's awesome. And one thing I find interesting too about your career, um, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about immersing in roles a little bit, you know, with, with Rad, for example, I know reading your book, uh, you know, the younger brother, or I guess your brother Sherman, who was almost killed when he rode his bike out there and your parents didn't really allow you on a bike. So when you got to, um, you know, to Rad, was there any nerves preparing for that role because you went on a, you know, bike or you didn't really have access to a bike at all? And you're like, oh my gosh, I gotta, you know, I gotta get myself into this role. No, I wish I had been a little more nervous, frankly, because I just felt very uh, relaxed that Hal Needham, who's this great stunt director, was going to have my back. And they had all these great stunt doubles. So I kind of didn't spend as much time on a bike as maybe I should have or could have. It was a very short time. I couldn't get to a professional level in a matter of weeks. Obviously, yeah. these guys had been on bikes uh, professionally for a number of years, and, and I had zero experience as being any sort of a professional on any level as far as bikes are concerned. So as it turned out, the movie plays well. The stunts uh, are, are kind of seamless. I look at, at my writing and I cringe because I'm now a better writer than I was. And it's really, somebody said, how could he win hell track if he couldn't bunny hop a curb? And so, <laughs> you know, you right. can't argue with, with what's on screen, but I, I still get people even accomplished. Right. Athletes who did my own stunts. So that's kind of funny. Yeah, that's awesome. Now you mentioned Hal Needham, who Hal, amazing, amazing stunt guy. And he directed Rad. Um, he saw your Hill Street Blues episode for your audition for Rad. Was that just something that happened quickly or how did that sort of play out? Yeah, it was very quick. Uh, it was a typical meeting. I didn't have to meet with a casting director, which is often the case. I was just brought in directly to meet with Hal and Robert Levy and Sam Bernard. And uh, I just read a couple of scenes, sat on a mongoose bike, and that was it. Wow. That was it. That's all I had to do for the role. So uh, I'm very unlucky in that way because often these these uh, auditions are kind of torturous and they drag it out over a long period of time, which had happened to me before. But this was, hey, you got the job. Congratulations. And, and probably a month later, I was in Calgary shooting that thing. So, again, I didn't have a lot of time to prepare. And I think that shows. Yeah. No, I, I, I mean, I just, I love the movie. I think you did, did awesome with it. It just, to me, it was just it was seamless. I felt, and like you said, with the, uh, the stunts and everything, you know, watching it as a kid. And obviously now you could see some of the things with Pat's hair on Lori Laughlin and stuff like that. But you, you could say, I mean, back as a kid, it, it really looked seamless, but you, know, you pick some things now, but still, I think it, I think it played well. I think it really was, it was awesome. So. Um, well, it's one of those things where the, the, the mistakes you know, you can see like the plywood on the logs as I'm writing. Right. It's just stuff that people love to pick apart and tear apart. Sure. And it confuses them because it's not a documentary. It's not reality, right. you right. know? And, and they talk about, well, what happened to crew? <laughs> what, are you, what, what are we actually talking about? Right. You know? Right. And so God bless them that, they, that it gets in their head. And that iconic shot at the end of the movie, it's such a setup for what right. happens next. Right. right. Well, nothing happened next. We got old. That's what happened next. Right. Next day. 30, 30, <laughs> 30 some odd years later, now the movie has been re-released and uh, and we're still talking about it. How crazy yeah. is that? Yep. And see, I got my I got my rad racing shirt on. <laughs> I was going to mention that. I know. Do you take that off when you shower? I know. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's great. I love it. It's awesome. But um, so you mentioned you get to Cochrane, Alberta, Canada, where where they shot the film and everything. And you're surrounded by all these these big Hollywood people. You know, got Talia Shire, the great Talia Shire. I mean, Ray Walston, you know, Jack Weston, who I love. Alfie Wise was awesome. And you had, then you had the Olympians like Bar Connor and then stunt guys, you know, Mike Miranda 
and, you know, Jose and all those guys, were you nervous around all these people? You know, a lot of these, these big shots, you as a young guy, you know, coming up and being around all these people, or was it just kind of, like you said, it was just relaxed, a relaxed environment. Uh, it was a relaxed set. However, I was spooked a bit uh, at Talia Shire. I mean, yeah. her, her brother's Francis Ford Coppola. She had been in what three movies that had gotten best picture Oscars. I yeah. mean, so yeah, she, she, she was like a, a, a national monument visiting the set in my mind. Right. It turns out she's very lovely and, and, and very approachable, but I was mindful not only of who she was, but her husband was producing the movie. So, right. so I was trying to be on my best behavior and did an okay job just an okay job but uh everybody else uh the players uh, were easy and fun and and um bart connor mr all america nicest guy you'll ever meet uh lori lachlan how could you not fall in love with this one i mean just gorgeous and and, and yep. fun to be with so yeah it was i mean i i try to think back and it was just a fun time. It was just a great time and everything you kind of want out of a movie, particularly all the fireworks with the with the stunts and right. seeing things that people had never seen before. Hell track and the drop in oh, wall and the backflip, which had never been done before. Right. So mm -hmm. we're kind of used to seeing it now. But at the time, it was really groundbreaking stuff and very exciting to be a part of. Yeah, and that was it was a Jose that did the, uh, the backflip, right? It was one of the first backflips or the first backflip, I think. The yeah. first backflip. He was brought in specifically for that stunt. They found out during pre-production that there's a guy out there that can do a backflip on a bike. It's like backflip on a bike? Who <laughs> has ever thought of that? So they brought him in for that one stunt and he did it, you know, as you know, several times during the uh, production. And it just, it kind of makes the movie in a lot of ways. Oh, yeah. Hulk Hogan, eat your heart out. I mean, it's right. such a, it's such a heart stopping thing. And it's a recall to the first reel of the movie when they're in the park. Yep. It just, it's, it's, it's laid in there perfectly, I would yeah. say. Yeah. And, and of course, obviously in the practice in the park there, you know, we always just say, Hey, you over rotate. That was one of the things we always used to take out, even skateboarding, biking, or what have you, or anything we did in school. Hey, you over rotated, you know, those comments. And it's just amazing how, it just sticks with you for this long and, and how it just played out in the movie so well with him doing that at the end. I mean, it just, you was on the edge of my seat, like, wow, it, he pulled it off. Amazing. And it was just a great finale. Um, and, and I loved hell track too. Hell track was absolutely amazing. Seeing that as a kid, you know, in the movie, I mean, was that like when you first saw that, you know, did that freak you out? And you're like, Oh my gosh, I know. I remember I read somewhere that some of the riders were all kind of freaked out, but were you, when you first saw that, were you kind of the same way? Like, oh my gosh, look at this thing. Oh yeah, it's heart stopping. Yeah. I mean, standing on the top of that wall gave everybody the willies, including the professional riders, look at that thing and they said, no, not going to do it. So it took <laughs> young Beetle Rosecrans, who was 14 or so at the time, and he's the one that dropped in first a little at a time, put a ladder up beside Hell Track and it kind of worked his way up. And so by that time, all the other writers were like, well, we got to go now. But they recreated the Hell Track a couple of years ago in Texas. And I got a, another opportunity to stand on that wall. And it is heart stopping. Oh, and pe people washed out on that thing and hurt themselves. And, and uh, it's no joke. Yeah. So even to this day, with all the advances we've made, that track is world class world class yeah. yeah so that's that's all how that's awesome and then obviously yeah. the other thing in the movie that i love was the ass sliding we you know my cousins and i we joke about that like every thanksgiving or christmas you know we it's funny we use the word crew jones hey crew jones that's you know we nickname each other that just because it's this movie's had an impact on us and, and you have as uh -huh. well but with that whole ass sliding thing uh I, I know i read it was you know cold water and things like that and obviously you had the great Lori lawson who was just mad just so beautiful on the screen how did you prepare for something like that? You know, it's something like that. I guess never been done. You're going down a pipe in cold water and what are you doing? Yeah, the only the yeah. only preparation was giving us wetsuits, which had no effect. I mean, they had to build this thing for the movie. It was supposed to be a waterfall, but there was no natural waterfall. Right. So they had to make this thing. And of course, you look at it, it's like, why is he taking Lori to an open sewer for their first date? Who knows? There's not much to do in that small town. So he does, and they end up in the sewer and the, and uh, yeah, we had on wetsuits, but the only preparation is they had Martin, my stunt double, go down first. And Hal took him aside and said, listen, 
make it look fun and easy and don't be miserable when you pop out of the water. I don't want to scare these actors, you know? And he did. And it didn't fool us. I knew that water was zero degrees. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and so luckily they shot it from a couple of different angles. So that's, we only did it once, but yeah, I mean, you know, again, you got Lori's legs wrapped around you. That didn't sure. suck, you know, oh, so yeah. you, didn't want, you didn't notice the cold water, but yeah, it was, it was frightening. Right. And that's what made it all better. The great Lori Law from just, just being mm-hmm. there. I mean, that, you know, I, that was one of my first crushes when I was little. I was like, wow, she's just gorgeous. And I just remember following her career too, but that, that had to make that all better. That scene, I'm sure. That's right. That's right. It was all good. I got to have a lot of fun. That's awesome. I'm sure another scene was the, uh, the bicycle boogie scene, you know, at the high school prom. Now, as I was little, I was like, wow, this is really cool. And then you get older, you start to, you know, pick it apart a little bit and you analyze and say, wow, you got like a high school sort of prom scene or dance scene and you got these bike executives there and you're like, you know, it's great. But I'm like, what are they doing? They're drinking punch. And all of a sudden you have what I thought was one of the great artistic scenes, you know, the, the dance and, and the boogie. Uh, what was that like going through that? Well, for me, it was easy. I mean, I, most of the action takes place without me and, and stunt doubles. And I was actually physically sick. I had food poisoning during the filming of that. So I just remember being passed out on one of the uh, bleachers. Uh, but yeah, there's plenty wrong with that scene. I mean, the old guys drinking booze at a high school. That, why are they there? Right. And why are these bicycle professionals mixing with teenagers? It's just like, it's wacky. Yeah. And then nobody cares because the you, you get in tra- you get hypnotized by Foxy. You oh. know, that, that takes yeah, know away wow. all sense of reason. And, 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 and so, yeah, and then you got the, the, the twins doing their thing. I mean, it's just... It's ridiculous, but it but somehow it's it's watchable and, and funny and, and fun. And the thing I like about Hal is he's very self-deprecating. Right. It's like there's a there's a lot of kind of winking at the camera, going, just just go with us on this one, guys. You know, we're just having fun here. Yeah. And and of course, Hal, there's so many things he innovated, but one was the uh the blooper reel, which obviously is not in rad, right. but he started that with the, the cannonball run and the smoky movies. That, wow. That was not done before. Why would they put mistakes in a movie? And he'd be like, keep that. We're putting that in. Right. And of course that fed into his filmmaking also. And in other words, the rotation, he over rotated scene. Yeah. That was a mistake. Uh, oh, wow. He actually did over rotate. That was not written in there. And oh, once wow. he once he crashed, Hal's like, "We're keeping it," and wrote that little dialogue in there. You over rotated notion. So that was all uh, written on the scene after Jose crashed, and that was that was part of Hal's gift. There's another scene uh, in the qualifying race where Crew takes a pedal to the head and get knocked knocked out. Actually. Eddie got a concussion, who was my stunt double, and not, you know, passed out right there. Wow. And so Hal just cut it in where he gets up, brushes himself off, and gets right back onto the, the track. And so that's the kind of thing that gives the action sequences such believability and immediacy. And, and you're like, was that a stunt? Did he mean yeah. to do that? Like the guy coming out of the cereal bowl? Oh, that right. was not planned. <laughs> that was a face plant, you know, but why would you leave that out? Oh, right. Yeah, some good, good things on it, too. Um, and it's interesting, too. I know the qualifying races, there was a couple of points where your character, you know, fell over and stuff. And people always said, you know, going through that one little section there, did, did Crew Jones ever cheat? And I'm like, no, I'm like, he found another way to go down there. And it's a little bit of a shortcut. And that is funny. That's something that's always debated. They keep saying, did Crew, you know, cut that off or did he cut, you know, cheat or anything like that? Have you ever heard that come up at all? Oh, dude, I was on uh, Tosh.0 several times, right. and the last time I was on, he's one of these guys like you who stays up thinking about these things, and so right. he opens the show, and he's like, Crew Jones cheated at qualifying, roll the tape, you know, and has me going through the tape, and then he goes off on me, and they have me planted in the audience, actually, and I stand up, and I'm like, I've had enough, and I storm out of the audience. I remember that. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, there's a lot of debate about this. And yeah, he he forged his mother's signature or had his sister do that. You know, I mean, he he kind of cut corners uh, to get where he was. You know, let's let's face it. But he would have never gotten to where he was. And I think, uh, 
you know, Bart waving him on so they could go head to head. It's right. like they had to do things. Yeah. These two characters had to do things so they could go mono a mono. Right. It, 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 you know, it was so it was important for the movie. It was important for the characters, the plot, all these things. These guys had to meet face to face with no other things holding them back. And that's that's just one of the beauties of that. <laughs> That, that final sequence. I'm so sorry. No, it's okay. It's okay. Real life. Can, can we all, hold on two seconds. Let me get rid of this dog. No hold problem. Take seconds. your time. Yeah. Take your time. So thinking about Rad, and this is like, I guess the one thing, me still trying to figure this out. It had a budget of $3 million and it, it did $2 million at the box office. I know we talked earlier before we got on here. Um, you know, I was a kid in the, in the you know, movie store or the, the rental store. They got the VHS tapes. Um, and I remember when the movies would come out, they had them behind the box, you know, like the box like this. And you had the movie. I used to take those and hide them in a the classic section because I always wanted to, to rent the movie and they finally saw me and figured it out. But I was just shocked that Rad really didn't take off. Do you have any theories on that at all? Because when you think about it, it's such an amazing story. You know, a, a kid really matures. He goes through all these, these challenges and things. You have, you know, the mom says, hey, you got to take your SATs. You got Bar Connor, the somebody in a villain or, you know, what have you, uh, and egg you on and trying to be him. And then you've got uh, the characters, um, you know, Duke, who's basically doesn't want you to race because he knows you're really good. Uh, why do you think that is? It just still to me this day stuns me. I'm great. It's taken on a life of its own and it's it's endured. But I just really was shocked when I read those numbers. Yeah, I don't think it was marketed very well and possibly to the wrong age demographic when it first hit theaters. But uh, as soon as it hit video where it was distributed wide everybody could get it at their video store it was in the top 20 for literally years so and a lot of these rentals were seen by a dozen kids you know a kid would rent it and everybody in the neighborhood would come and and, and watch it so even right. one rental might be viewed multiple times or by multiple people so even right. uh, the numbers it was getting on video rentals were not even emblematic of the actual numbers, I think. So uh, that is kind of the narrative that it was a flop. Well, yeah, it didn't do well at the original box office opening, but uh, yeah, so many people have got to see it on VHS that it became part of the culture, right? It became part of the fabric. And so by the time it got a wide release, people were just ready for it hugely yeah. ready for it now COVID knocked out a lot of our plans sure. it, it was accepted at South by Southwest we were going to do the festival there right uh Alamo Draft House was going to have us go across the country and do a tour and even with all that stuff getting knocked out uh it's been a great hit on on uh video and downloading and and the Vinegar Syndrome Syndrome release was a huge hit and now it's getting another release on DVD. So it's just, it will not die. That's, yeah, keep it going. Do you ever think though, there could be like a part two to Rad maybe, or, you know, I know they're remaking a lot of, a lot of Hollywood uh, movies from the eighties and stuff. I don't, I don't see a remake, but do you think there could ever be like a part two potentially or like something down the road maybe? Anything could happen. Yeah, no, I'd love to see that. <laughs> I know I'm sure a lot of, uh, a lot of people would love to see it. Um, you know, in your book, you mentioned, you know, some lessons learned in your, you know, your acting career. Uh, you went back on tour uh, and didn't go to premiere for, you know, for the movie. And, and I remember reading, you mentioned there was no limit to pick you up and you turn on the TV and it's all, you know, Halloween Christmas parade too, going down the street and everyone was in, was invited. Was that just like one of those big career moments of like lesson learned, like, okay, I got it. Or at the time, what, what, what kind of was going through your head there? Yeah. I mean, I got the lesson. I understood what I did wrong, when I did it, I think the punishment was clear and, uh, and I got over it. I mean, some people have real problems in their lives, you know, and I, I don't think me not showing up at the premiere had any impact on the box office. Right. I mean, it, it wasn't going to be splashed across People magazine. But what I found out is promoting a movie is part of your job as a performer. You, you, once you, you finish the movie and your paycheck is done, you're not done. You still have to go out and promote the thing. Right. And I actually was, I was on the road promoting it. I just, I wasn't at the premiere for a stupid reason, but uh, I, I've since seen the air of my ways and have made this a big part of my journey is talking to rad fans, 
going to festivals, going to screenings, of course, you know, has changed during the COVID times, but uh, I'm getting back to that. A couple of fans have flown all across the country uh, to come to my house Saturday and we're going to sit in the backyard and watch the movie. Oh, wow. That is awesome. Yeah. That's, that's gotta be something. So interesting. Um, yeah. And I know also too, in your book too, you had another sort of uh, incident and kind of curious how you got through this the movie platoon. You know, you're reading with at the time, Oliver Stone's a little known uh, director or Hollywood producer at the time. And you read and seemed to have the part and everything like that. And I think they weren't able to secure um, the funding. And then all of a sudden, Charlie Sheen gets cast and wins Best Picture and Best Director. I mean, what was going through your head at the time to just say, hey, is this, is it me? Or did you just try to plow through that and say, that's life, these things happen? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I was pretty busy at the time and I got to work with Oliver anyway. So, and I still draw paychecks from the time I did. So, uh, you know, you can dwell on the missed opportunities, but why would I do that? I've had a really rich career and life and, and it continues to this day. And now these stories to me are funny. Right. Is that something I want in my life? You know, I'm really, I'm really kind of happy with the way things have turned out. Gotcha. And you're now doing, uh, you created a blues band called Pipe Fitters and Lou Diamond Phillips is in that too. So you're kind of doing something a little different as well or? Well, I've done music uh, since the early nineties and I toured with Lou extensively uh, throughout the States, did Farm Aid one year and, and uh, recorded some really cool stuff, soundtracks and stuff like that. So uh, Lou's in New York right now on The Prodigal Son. It's a Fox series. He's directing a couple of episodes of that and stars in it. Uh, but I continue to keep my hand in it. Uh, I produced a record with Kenny Aronoff uh, awesome. a number of years ago. And then uh, I'm planning my next uh, music production very soon. Yeah, That's awesome. I know you yeah. mentioned too, just, you know, life, just a lot of setbacks and things, you know, your late great Brandon Lee was, was a great friend of yours. I love that movie pro loved him. And uh, I know you had a, a best friend too, Kirk growing up that, that passed away. Uh, and so many of us, you know, get stuck in that. And I've had friends and, and very close family members pass away and it really impacts us. How do you get through those tragedies? And especially with acting, I mean, you got to show goes on, you got to keep doing things, but how do you just say, I got to get through this and, and move forward? I mean, that's, that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, everybody's lost somebody or most of us have that close. And I, I lost uh, my older brother when I was 13, I think. Yeah. And that was a big lesson for me in that <clears throat> I wasn't going to jump in the grave with anybody. Right. You know, you can't be sad enough to bring somebody back from the great beyond as painful as it is. Right. So I, I know my loved ones still love me and they want me to be happy. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I grieve as much as I need to, because that's an important thing. And then I, then I try to move on and appreciate the, the small things and the everyday things and the, and the joys that I have in my life. And, uh, you know, a great part of the beauty of a rose is the fact that it's temporal and will not be there for very long. Right. You know, so, so uh, that's life. And, and, and we miss these people more than anything, but, but again, if you jump into that grave, it just closes you off on the opportunities and the relationships that still come. Right. Gotcha. Well, this has been great, Bo. Just got a couple of quick things for you here, and then uh, we'll wrap this up. Um, so one thing I ask everybody is, what is one piece of advice you can give somebody? So let's say somebody wants to break into um, to acting. What's one piece of advice you'd give somebody if they asked you, hey, Bill, how, how do I get into acting? What do I do? Oh, well, I would... I would uh, ask you to search your heart as, as far as what you want to do. Do you want to be in theater? Do you want to do a sitcom? Do you want to be in movies and, and pursue that thing specifically? And other things will come, but if you're able to focus, it's a lot easier. Right. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. So what's next for Bill Allen? Uh, where's your career go from here? Well, I'm producing a couple of projects right now. I've got a documentary I'm working on. Um, that I'm really excited about, about one of my friends from back in the day. Awesome. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm writing, I'm, I'm uh, promoting my rad career, which just came out the second edition. It's okay. been out for a while now, but it's now on hardcover and softcover from Beacon 
publishing group, but yep. you can go to my, you can go to myradcareer.com. And there you go. You've got yeah, this is the hard here. Yeah, it's a great book. It really is. It's amazing. Well, it got picked up by a real New York publisher uh, through uh, no effort of mine. They just wow. saw the Amazon, they just saw the Amazon reviews and picked it up. So I'm very fortunate, very fortunate. Yeah. That's so awesome. you can go to my rag career and find that. That's great. And, and these shirts are still around too. So you can get rags. You can shirts. find them <laughs> everywhere. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Now you, you didn't keep anything from, from the movie at all. I was always curious. Did you ever keep the bike? You know, cause that's gotta be an infamous bike. <laughs> oh man. I wish I had kept anything. I can't even find my script from it, but I know the guy who has <clears throat> the bicycle from the poster and uh, he paid $70,000. Wow. for that. Jeez. Yeah. yeah. So know. they hold their value. <laughs> oh yeah. I was going to say a lot of things do. I'm sure that's amazing. Well, this has been wonderful, but I really appreciate you, uh, you taking the time, uh, just been a treasure, just kind of going through your life and, and your journey and your career. And uh, I know in your book, you said Jose was one of the, the unsung heroes, but I still think rad. I mean, it, it, you make that movie too. I mean, just the way you acted, your personality and, and how you came across and I just, you feel it. And it just, it's a movie that resonated with me for, for so many years and still does and friends and family love it. So we appreciate your career and what you've given to all of us. It's been, it's been awesome. So thank you for so much for, for coming on here. That's very humbling, Joe. Thank you. It's been great. Yeah, that's awesome. Bill Allen, everybody. Was that not awesome interviewing the great Bill Allen? Truly so much fun. And it was like a trip down memory lane. I was a little kid in a candy store. I wanted more. And Bill caught my rad shirt before the start of the interview. That was a lot of fun. We were talking about what rad meant to me. And I picked up on two things with Bill. I mean, Bill worked with Talia Shire, the great Talia Shire, Jack Weston, Ray Walsh, and Alfie Wise, Bar Connor, the Olympian, uh, the stunt guys, and, and actually the professional BMXers, Hollywood Mike Miranda, Eddie Fiola, Jose, who did the backflip. And what was truly interesting, what Bill said, was Jose made that movie that with the backflip, there's no rad. Well, Bill being Bill, so humble, I really believe there's no rad without Bill Allen, without Crew Jones. Bill made Crew Jones and what made that movie amazing. Everybody else was totally fantastic in that movie, but think about it. There's no rad without Bill Allen and Crew Jones. And I think also, too, what was interesting to learn from Bill is after rad, he went back to acting school. A lot of people don't do that. He went back and practiced, practiced some more. Even when he had some ups and downs, he continued to practice and get better. Loves his work and loves what he does. And it was just so much fun. Couldn't get enough of uh, chatting with Bill. But I hope you guys enjoyed it and got something out of this. And we'll see you next time on the Korean Life Show.